artificial, artificial intelligence is being tapped as a solution for numerous challenges in areas ranging from trade to manufacturing. But businesses and investors are betting on using the technology to diagnose and treat mental health conditions. Melissa Goh looks at the many possibilities. Could the future of managing mental health lie in strings of code and algorithm? Data firm Holmusk certainly thinks so. It's partnering local authorities to develop a suite of digital tools for hospitals and clinics. It tells you what, what is it in queue, which is a high risk, which is not a high risk. Among solutions it's looking to introduce in the next 18 months, a sensor embedded in a pill to alert clinicians when patients have taken the medication. A patch detects the ingested pill and alerts an app. Doctors can intervene early if patients forget their dose. The company also wants to tap data like heart rate and sleep patterns from smartphones to build predictive models. In short, it wants to use answers already at our fingertips to solve some questions surrounding mental health treatment. A big part of where AI plays a role is more complex patients, where the answers are not obvious. Um, and let's say you, somebody comes in and you stabilize them and you keep them in the hospital. When is it okay to release them? And when you say, okay, what would be the effect of their external environment into which you are releasing them into them being able to maintain that stability? Holmusk wants to pull national data on mental illness so that it can identify patients, including those at high risk of bipolar disorder due to their genes. Other industry players are also looking to tap artificial intelligence to help people take care of their own mental health. Firms say the pandemic has been a huge boost, bringing mental health to the forefront for both investors and clients. It's also helped to change the perception of the usefulness of digital tools and open many people's minds up to getting help online. Karis Liang used to suffer from depression. And now that she's more stable, the 24-year-old student uses this app for quick help sessions when she's overwhelmed. Users indicate how they're feeling on the app, which then taps AI to recommend what are called guided journeys. The platform also taps AI to match users with suitable therapists. It's great because I can do it anytime, uh, even daily. And with sort of a therapist, you can't really do that because you, you need to sort of uh, book a time, um, drag yourself to the office, and sometimes there are just barriers between you and accessing the resource. Intellect says it's attracted 3 million users globally since it launched about two years ago. And key to its success is privacy. Since day one, been one of our biggest priorities to ensure that we create an experience that's um, seamless but also very, very confidential. We use something called zero-knowledge encryption, which means that the data is only on the person's device will always ensure that privacy for them. But there are still other hurdles to cross. Industry insiders cite ethical considerations and plugging an education gap on AI's benefits. And for more on mental health and AI, we're joined by Assistant Professor Wilson Goh from the Data Science Research Program at NTU's Lee Kong Chien School of Medicine. Professor Goh, uh, your study or your work, if I could very crudely summarize it, you're using AI to build a unique model for individuals, drawing on huge amounts of data from other individuals who are related to this individual. Uh, first, is that correct? Two, assuming that is what you're doing, does this unique model help you better identify, I suppose, incipient mental health risks, as well as uh, maybe propose the kinds of treatment that would better be able to manage this level of risk? Thank you for the question. Um, so this AI uh, that we're developing is known as, as an approach known as transductive personalized modeling or personalized AI. And you have actually described it quite well, I would say. And we are actually trying to apply this data on a cohort of, of over 600 young people aged between 18 to 29, collecting their biological, clinical, and cognitive data across two years. And this is quite possibly one of the largest diversity of data that's ever been tackled in a single study. The aim is that by connecting the biological data with the clinical and cognitive data, we better understand how these different data types interact. And this provides us with a molecular basis of behavior. 
Uh, Professor Goh, based upon the fact that you are collecting a vast amount of data, uh, that data also would have a great deal of complexity and nuance within it as well. Uh, let's talk about accuracy here. How accurate do you hope to be, given that there is a, a great range of mental health issues in the definition of, of such issues? Hmm. Thank you for the question, Don. AI is a very powerful tool, and we can develop various specialized AIs to probe into different kinds of mental health issues. The model can be tuned to further improve its accuracy. It can also be fed with many different types of data so that it becomes more robust. There are also transfer learning models that can be continuously fed with more data, so it progressively improves. Well, Professor Go, uh, I suppose in principle, one can improve uh, uh accuracy as much as you like. But ultimately, what a machine does is very different from what a clinician actually does in terms of identifying and treating mental health issues. So people who are more used to the old approach, so a person, a patient, a clinician, a person, I look at you, I diagnose, and then I treat you, they're going to be saying, I just don't see how AI tools are going to be helping me on my job. Uh, how open in your job have you found clinicians to actually using these tools to assess mental health? Well, in my experience, there are many who are curious, they are interested, and they want to find out more. The knowledge and attitudes and perspectives of the end user is really important to appreciate and to address. The end users, including clinicians, healthcare workers, and sometimes the patients themselves, they need to be educated on the AI and its users. There are expected challenges in any change management, and this is not something that's unique just to AI and healthcare. But the more disruptive the change, the bigger, the barrier, and the challenge to cross. I like to think of this as a co-evolution process between the AI, the clinician, and the patient. Uh, Professor Goh, you know, as Singapore moves more towards predictive health modeling and so on, AI is going to be uh, relied upon uh, uh, more, you know, as we move along with this, and of course its adoption is important, but are there ethical or legal considerations uh, that we really ought to be taking into account when using AI to assess something as personal as mental health? Mm, this is a really big topic, so I'm just going to keep this brief. When it comes to ethical and legal issues on AI itself, we should think about FAT or FAT. This stands for Fairness, Accountability and Transparency. Fairness is about ensuring the AI does not marginalize certain groups, especially those which are vulnerable. Accountability means whom should take responsibility should something go wrong. It is not always the case the end user should automatically be at fault. The transparency is important in explainable AI research. Transparency is about being able to understand what goes on under the hood of the AI and whether the AI behaves in a manner that is logical and meaningful. But we must also not forget that AI depends on data from real people. And so issues like confidentiality, data protection, and sharing mechanisms still needs to be resolved. Oh, thanks so much for joining us. Assistant Professor Wilson Gold from NTU.